Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the MSU Water School webinar series. This is webinar number two of four, ending on November 19th. My name is Mary Bowling. I'm an educator with the MSU Extension Sea Grant Program. I will be your host for and moderator throughout the webinar series. As indicated in our opening slides, MSU programs are open to anyone and everyone. If you're having technical difficulties, please let us know in the chat and one of our behind the scenes staff will try and help. Today's webinar is being recorded and includes a presentation on water quality, followed by Q&A with the presenter and then a panel discussion and more Q&A with panelists if time allows. Because this is a webinar format, the speaker option is not available for participants. Instead, please type your questions into the Q&A box. My colleagues will be monitoring the questions and will present them during the Q&A portions of our agenda. Questions that go unanswered during the webinar will be addressed and sent out to all participants about a week after the webinar. Okay, so let's get started. Our presenter for the water quality topic today is Eric Elgin, a limnologist and water resources educator with MSU Extension. His main responsibilities are to promote and research the wise use, protection, and restoration of our freshwater systems. Eric's recent efforts focus on aquatic plants, lake management, natural shorelines, invasive species, and improving the knowledge of decision makers to make sound water management decisions. Eric has an MS in aquatic ecology from the University of Calgary and a BS in natural resources management from the University of Minnesota. Welcome, Eric. Thank you for joining us today. Well, hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. And, and I look forward to talking uh, for the next 45 minutes about a huge topic. Uh, in water quality, we we hope what we're what we're hoping for is that we're going to give you some foundational information to help uh, foster uh, sound water management decisions in uh, different communities or as individuals um, or in whatever positions you may hold. Um, in order to do that for such a large topic over a short amount of time, we'll be covering. Um, looking at water quality broadly, and then we're going to look at uh, specific issues that come up uh, in communities across Michigan, and hopefully that'll, that'll help uh, with our understanding. So first, what is water quality? Uh, this is actually very difficult to define because it depends, uh, and it depends on its intended use. So for example, if we were looking at a water body, uh, like a, a lake or a reservoir, where uh, it is very green. So an abundance of algae is growing there. If that water body was uh, planned to be used or is used for drinking water, that water, that water would be in poor condition, be poor water quality. And that's because algae can produce toxins or smells or tastes that would be difficult to, to uh, mitigate for drinking water. However, that same water body um, might be looked at by uh, by anglers as a great place to fish for bass. And that's because there's an abundance of food there um, due to the algae that goes up to the different trophic levels that will give you large and abundant bass. And so the angler might look at that same water body and say, this has good water quality for their use of fishing. And so this is why when we define water quality and saying, is my water body bad or is my water bad? You have to look at what the use is. If it's drinking water, that's different from if it's a recreational water only, or if it's a water body used for fishing. And although it's obvious and you're all here for a reason that you've signed up for, but water quality matters. And it matters on many different levels. Broadly speaking, environmentally, um, this makes sense. The better the water quality, the better the habitat is for the different organisms that live uh, and reproduce in those systems. So if habitats are intact, the um, system is in better condition, you have the water quality meant for those species to thrive. When we look economically, water quality matters because when we see, we see this on different, uh, across the United States in different communities, as water quality declines, so for example, if water clarity declines, the, uh, the uh, land 
property values decline around that lake. And that's the same for if an invasive species then invades that lake. So an invasive species like Eurasian milfoil may, uh, may go into a lake, may invade a lake, and the property values decline in those situations as well. So there's an economic impact to the water quality. Um, and this can be seen maybe a little broader as well to the community for tourism. If a water body is known to be a great walleye fishery and uh, people come from all over to go fishing in that water body. So they buy gas, they buy food, they eat at restaurants, they stay at hotels in that community. There's a, there's, uh, there's a net impact to ec the economy with good water quality to support that fishery. But if that fishery is contaminated with um, pollutants like dioxins or PCBs or PFAS, and you can't eat those fish as much anymore, if at all, um, then you, would, you could potentially lose that tourism. And then moving on to the social side of things, we, our sense of place is connected to the water here in Michigan because we have so much of it. And that connection is connected also to the quality of that water. So as water quality declines, that impacts our sense of place. And then moving into our health, these are the obvious impacts. If there are contaminants that are toxic to our health, there's immediate impacts to us in the short term and long term, where it could be E. coli or it could be industrial contaminants. What's interesting is that water wasn't necessarily looked at in uh, uh, at a broad sense those those three ways. Instead, it was more looked at as a place for us to empty our waste into. Um, before the Clean Water Act in the in the early 1970s, we were uh, we, we were putting in a lot of different things. Um, these pictures show some very famous areas. The top right, this picture here, shows the Cuyahoga River uh, on fire um, due to the different debris and uh, chemicals that had been put into, the, into that river over the many, many years. Um, and what's, you know, so the Cuyahoga River is, is very well known for that, but even the Rouge River here in Michigan burst into flames as well. And here's an image of one of the uh, uh, firefighting boats putting out the fire um, from the Rouge River. Um, and now it's been almost 50 years um, since, or just over 50 years since that fire took place here in Michigan. Um, so our, our water bodies weren't always looked at environmentally, socially, and, and health and economics. When we talk about pollutants in water, we talk about these very broad um, pools, broad buckets. One is point source pollution, the other is non-point source pollution. So point source pollution is, uh, is like you can point at where the, that uh, pollutant is discharging into the environment. So this can be a smokestack that's going into the atmosphere. It could be a pipe that's uh, discharging directly into a river, into a lake. And so you can really point at it. Um, and now, when we think of non-point source pollution, this is a little bit harder to define or, or get, get a head around, but it's, it's pollutants that are being spread over, over a wide area. Um, and so, for example, I, what we can do is picture a, a city neighborhood and in a rainstorm. And so, as the rain falls on the different surfaces, like rooftops, the asphalt, our sidewalks, it's picking up little pieces of pollutants. And as it, it all comes together, it's coming from all over that landscape, goes into our sewers, and then enters into the uh, river or water body. And that would be considered non-point source pollution. A study done in, by the EPA uh, published in 2010 looked at some of the major pollutants in our uh, lakes, reservoirs, and rivers throughout the United States. And some of them are not very surprising. We've, we see these in, here in Michigan as well, so pathogens. Sediments and pathogens can be E. coli, for example, fe fecal coliform sediments. So that's a pollutant that we often don't think of as a pollutant, um, but it actually is a major uh, problem because it can impact lots of different species and the characteristics of our water. Nutrients, mostly phosphorus and nitrogen. And then we get into more of the um, industrial and legacy contaminants in mercury, PCBs, and dioxins. And Again, we, we kind of have this intuitively. Some of the major sources are agriculture, um, non-point sources, uh, atmospheric deposition, 
and hydro modification like channelization of and and habitat modification and just as an example for atmospheric deposition i'll link atmospheric deposition with mercury so in our when we burn coal mercury is released up into the atmosphere when there it either falls onto the onto the ground by dry deposition or through precipitation once there it can lead into our water bodies and once in the water bodies how it can get into us is through uh, fish so it goes into the food chain and then goes into the fish we eat and bio magnifies into us but there's lots of ways that pollutants move across the landscape through overland runoff through seepage and just linking in if if uh, folks uh, participants here on the on the webinar saw Ruth's uh, presentation on water quantity, we know that there's a lot of connections between the different pools of water out there. And so as things seep into the groundwater, that groundwater may end up in uh, discharging into a surface water at some point. And then this is how we can have one contaminated area over here and still contaminate um, uh, a water body far away. And something just to highlight a little bit more is biological pollutants. So this would be uh, E. coli. It can be invasive species. It can be this bacteria, leptospirosis, which is rat fever. I specifically highlighted this one because the, uh, in the 80s, uh, unfortunately, an, an individual fell into the Rouge River and got this bacteria into their body and, and, and died. And this bacteria is known uh, to be in areas with uh, raw sewage in it. So um, this is when the Rouge River still had some major impairments um, that needed to be fixed. And this is just one example of why. So the next now part of the presentation, I'm gonna go over some specific water quality issues and some background to those issues. And I'm gonna start off with non-point source pollution and specifically looking at stormwater, nutrients, and road salt. Um, this is a great picture just to show the, our impact on the landscape and how that can uh, change and increase our non-point source pollution. Lots of vegetation is removed. There's lots of pavement. There's lots of large homes. Um, and we, with this, we see a lot more non-point source pollution. So we'll talk about that. Then going into persistent contaminants, and there's a lot of them. So we're going to focus on PFAS. And then moving into habitat loss and how that impacts uh, water quality. So to get us started, we're going to talk about watersheds. A watershed is the entire area that drains to a common body of water. We all live in one. And what's important to note is that it doesn't stop at our different political boundaries. Um, these are natural delineations. And so this is really important to know because when you're in one community trying to do um, beneficial practices for water quality in your community, you might actually be impacted by a community uh, above you who, where the stream is flowing into you. And so you might be making a huge effort, but if other communities around you who are connected aren't making the same um, practices, putting the same practice in place, you might not be getting as big of a benefit. And so working together is really important because we look at the watershed. And something just a common thread that I'll be saying throughout this presentation is what we do on land impacts our water. And this is when we, so what we do in our watersheds impacts our water. So broadly looking at, uh, at, a, at a broad scale, at a high level scale, when we look at watersheds, we can look at it as like the Great Lakes watershed. So the Great Lakes watershed is everything here in this boundary. So everything that drains into the Great Lakes, but then the Great Lakes are all draining into the St. Lawrence Seaway, which drains into the Atlantic Ocean. And so uh, anything done in this, in this land area ends up could be impacting the Great Lakes. When we zoom in a little closer, we can see that the watersheds can be broken up into smaller pieces of land. And so we can see that there are different water, uh, different river systems, different, wa different watersheds that drain into Lake Superior, into Lake Michigan, and into Lake Huron and Lake Erie. Um, and zooming, and this can tell us a lot. You know, we can, we can start to get an understanding of what communities should be 
um, talking to one another to uh, work on water quality issues. When we zoom even further, we can see, um, so for example, looking at the Southeast Michigan watersheds, we can see the political boundaries here and see how the watersheds cross all over them. When we talk about water quality in watersheds, we often start by thinking about land cover and land use. So land cover uh, describes the predominant vegetation within a landscape, and then land use is the predominant use that we do on the land. So for example, um, this yellow that we see, this is in what was once a lot of prairie, the prairie biome in the United States, and now is mostly row crops. So the yellow is, is talking about like corn, soybean, wheat, and uh, ag like that. And then when we move into this more orange color where cropland and pasture, and then the green is referring to forest and the red is urban. And then we have some large wetland complexes as well. Another look um, from a neat uh, map from the Michigan Natural Features Inventory shows Michigan's land cover in a little bit more detail. And you can obviously see, and we all know this, is that there's this obvious north-south gradient between uh, the, the different land uses. So you can really see this is the, uh, this lightish tan is a lot of ag. The red is the urban, and then it moves more into the natural systems. We talk a lot about the land cover and land use because as we change the, veget the natural vegetation or we remove the natural vegetation, we start to have greater impacts on our water. And when we, uh, when we look at urban areas, this is one of the reasons why, impervious surface. So in a natural system with natural vegetation, when water falls onto the landscape, uh, much of it is either uh, infiltrates into the groundwater, either shallow or deep, or it is transpired back into the atmosphere and very little is, is, is runoff. But now in contrast, as we go into our urban environments with a lot of impervious cover, like paved uh, roads, our homes, our buildings, um, much things change a little bit. We get a lot more runoff. We don't get as much infiltration. And we have about the same transpiration, but it's this runoff number that's really important. So here's another uh, a real life look at, at what we see. So here's land use or land cover uh, in the Rouge watershed. And as you can see, there's some ag areas in yellow, but mostly a developed um, watershed, which makes sense. It's in the Detroit metropolitan area. And the darker the red, the higher intensity development it is. And this has a, a, an obvious connection with the impervious surface. So as we have higher uh, developed intensity, we have more uh, impervious surface. So why does this matter? Why does it matter that we have, if we have more impervious surface and we get more runoff from that? Well, that's because it's not just water. Runoff is not just water. As water runs off of the landscape, off of the different buildings, off of the different surfaces, it, pick, it can pick up in, uh, different pollutants. And so common ones that we find in our urban and agricultural areas are pesticides, fertilizers, oils, heavy metals, salts, bacteria, trash, yard waste, sediment. There's tons of different things that can go into our uh, runoff water. And this has some big Im uh, implications because we had to think about where does the water go? So the water is picking up all of these pollutants um, throughout the landscape in our developed landscape. And in an urban environment, it goes down one of these, a storm drain. Now in certain communities, we have combined sewers and some they are not combined. And so combined is referring to where your storm sewer is connected to your wastewater treatment plant. And so your wastewater and storm water go to a treatment plant and, and get treated and then discharged into a river or water body. And uh, when they, the, there's a problem with those. So first of all, it's, it's fine if it doesn't rain that much or if the rain, uh, or if the infrastructure can handle it. But oftentimes in large rain events, the infrastructure can't handle that. And the wastewater treatment plant is designed to then open up and release the uh, untreated waste into a water body. 
So that causes many issues. So in some communities, they're not connected. But in those communities, when they're not com connected, that means the storm water goes direct, mostly or always goes directly into a water body. Sometimes there can be sediment retention basins um, or other green infrastructure, but oftentimes it goes directly into the drain and into a water body without any filtering or cleaning. And hence why we have these stickers that you see with no dumping drains to river. And when we look at the agricultural landscape, we also have some issues here. When you remove the vegetation and you expose soil, you have the potential of erosion. And so you can have gully erosion, sheet erosion, where a lot of, of sediment can be moved. Uh, a lot of uh, soil can be lost. And so that's sediment going into our water, but it's also what does that sediment contain? It can contain some um, contaminants as well. And this is common over here where this is a drain tile coming out of a uh, field. And although that water looks clear, that water can contain um, high amounts of different contaminants, specifically nutrients. And that's being studied heavily right now um, in many different areas looking at the content of phosphorus in uh, water coming out of drain tiles. So why do we care so much about nutrients? Uh, why, is that, why are nutrients pollutants? So um, we care so much about nutrients because the more nutrients, specifically nitrogen and phosphorus, that go into a water body, the more primary production we have. So the more plant growth, this can come in aquatic plants, but also algae, benthic algae, filamentous algae, phytoplankton, which are pelagic free-floating algae. And um, in, in, in water bodies, there's a natural process called eutrophication. But when we start to manipulate the watersheds and we release a lot of nutrients into our water bodies, we call that cultural eutrophication where lots of nutrients are coming in because of us, and that's causing um, algal problems, plant problems. Um, and, and those activities, like I've already kind of mentioned, are it could be agriculture, it could be fertilizer use on lawns, um, it can be erosion, sewage, uh, animal wastes, lots of different things. And uh, one of the big problems that comes with eutrophication can be harmful algal blooms or HABs. Um, or another term is cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, all kind of referring to, to similar things. And what this is, is some algae have the potential, or some bacteria, cyanobacteria, have the potential of producing toxins. Um, and this was in the news not too long ago where Toledo had to close off its uh, drinking water supply because there was a harmful algal bloom uh, blooming in, in Lake Erie which caused a lot of issues for a lot of people. Another way that nutrients um, can impact us is with our health. So the, when nitrogen fertilizers are applied um, through time and in a large amounts, um, there can be leaching of nitrogen because nitrogen can be picked up by the plants. It can be utilized within the soil by bacteria and there can be some degassing into the atmosphere but some with some depends can go into our groundwater. If it builds up into the groundwater, we can have some issues to our health, uh, particularly to our babies and pregnant women with the blue baby syndrome, where high nitrates in our blood rob the ability of our hemoglobin to uptake oxygen. And so that can cause lots of issues. Um, this is an old map um, you know, from 1983 to 2003. So, Make sure if you're curious, if you're in one of these communities that have higher amounts of nitrate, take a look at um, Eagles. Uh, I hope Eagle likely has some new data out there. But as you can see, there was some areas within Michigan that have um, high nitrate concentrations within the groundwater. And kind of rounding out um, this, uh, my non-point source uh, pollution portion is looking at road salt. Um, the, this has gained a lot of steam because as we studied it, we started seeing some big implications. So um, road salt is predominantly sodium chloride, so that's salt, and we measure um, road salt as a pollution by looking at the chloride levels. And as you can see, not surprising, we see higher um, 
chloride in our lakes. This is a this is a map of our lakes that were studied for chloride and higher concentrations of chloride in our urban areas where we use a lot of, of um, road salt. And so what do these numbers mean? Um, well, we've started to see that we can, at low levels, um, we start to see some impacts to our freshwater organisms. Specifically what's been studied are the zooplankton, which are little organisms that swim and eat algae uh, in our uh, in our lakes and rivers and other waters. And we start to see some disruptions to their populations at pretty low levels. And um, for us, we start seeing some impacts more where water starts to become a little salty at 250 milligrams per liter. Now, not surprising. Um, so th this is, this is the, looking at the same data. The, on this axis, the vertical axis, we're seeing percent urban land cover in a lake drainage area. And on the horizontal axis, we're just seeing the, the uh, chloride levels. And so we can see here is the more land cover, the, the more percent land cover, the higher amounts of chloride we're seeing, which makes sense because there's more paved areas that we are applying road, to, road salt to. So moving on to uh, my next section in persistent uh, contaminants. And uh, the, there, there's many different contaminants out here, out there. Um, we typically, as individuals, get exposed to them um, by eating or drinking um, or breathing them in. And uh, when, we, when we think about our, in water qual in, for our waters, we're exposed to them when we're eating fish. And so persistent contaminants, what we're talking about here is contaminants that stay around in the environment for a long time can usually be easily transported throughout a landscape and can bioaccumulate in our different organisms. By bioaccumulate, what I mean is that little organisms get exposed, but those little organisms are eaten by larger organisms, and then they get a little bit more of that contaminant in them. And then as they get into fish, or the big predator in the system, um, that fish may have quite a bit now of that contaminant. And so when we eat it, we can be exposed. This is why we have our Eat Safe Fish guidelines out there. Um, and different water bodies have different Im impairments. This is an old sign. So um, the regulations are a little different now, but this is for uh, the Titabawasi River uh, from Midland to Saginaw in effect because of dioxins and PCBs that accumulate in these fish then, and then can enter us and have, and have negative uh, consequences to our health. The one example, because it's, uh, we're, it's an emerging contaminant around the world and in Michigan is PFAS. So that's per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. It's actually refer, PFAS is referring to thousands of chemicals um, formed from carbon and fluorine chains. And these have been, in, uh, been manufactured for quite a long time since the 40s. Um, and just more and more have been developed through time. These are persistent in the environment um, and are found in the human body. And there's broad statements out there that everyone in the world likely has some PFAS in their blood. Um, so it's in a lot of products. It's in, a, in it's, it, we're finding it in a lot of places. And unfortunately, they don't break down very easily and they accumulate um, through time. And there is evidence that, they, that exposure can lead to adverse impacts to our health. So for example, um, here are a few um, that have been identified, which could be increased risk, risk of thyroid disease, um, cholesterol levels, fertility, decreases in fertility in women, um, lower infant birth weight, and different kinds of cancer. Um, and uh, so, so there is quite a bit. What's, what's unfortunate is that PFAS, different PFAS have been shown to pass through the placental wall. And so this is why it can, it can it's not just babies and, and mothers, it's also um, fetuses. And here's a map um, from the Environmental Working Group. So if you type in PFAS Environmental Working Group into Google, you'd be able to use this interactive uh, map so you can zoom into your community to see if you have any um, 
uh, problems with PFAS in your community. And so you can see that it's a little tough to see, but there's some where there's military sites, some are drinking water supplies, and then some are others could be ponds or other um, known sites. And so you can see they're, they're found throughout Michigan. Uh, Michigan has done a lot of, of work trying to find the locations with large amounts of PFAS. And uh, so the, the federal government does have a drinking water standard at 70 parts per trillion, but Michigan now has some new standards. Um, and I'd encourage you to go to the Eagle website or the MPART website. That's where you can learn about um, Michigan's response to the PFAS um, emerging PFAS issues, MPART, and um, you can learn about the different um, drinking water standards for different kinds of PFAS. Okay, so moving on to habitat loss. Um, and one of the best ways, I can, I can tell you a lot about what's happened to habitat in, in Michigan, but one of the best ways to show is, is through um, historical imagery. So this is a, a couple slides, uh, courtesy of the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. Um, so here's a, a picture of a typical lake here in Michigan. We have um, some natural land cover in its wa immediate watershed, but then also some agricultural use. And then immediately around the uh, lake, we have uh, quite a bit of development, as you can see with all of this. These are different, these are homes. Um, if we look back in time, here's uh, from 1938, we can see that there was definitely some agriculture still in the, that, that was in the watersheds or in the watershed, but a lot less development. There looks like to be some development. And now what we're gonna do just to show what has changed through time, we're gonna zoom into specific areas within this lake. So the first one we're gonna look is this um, wetland habitat up here. So um, what we can see here is a wetland shoreline and these are actually emergent vegetation that's coming out into the lake. So emergent vegetation, think of cattails and rushes, bulrushes and, and things like that. Um, so this is 1938 and here it is. And I, I, I would ask you to look at this right here. This is a wetland complex. So I'll show that one more time. So as you can see that wetland complex has changed completely. We have, a tr it was channelized and then developed with homes that look like they're on 50 foot um, um, width lots. And we had a lot of development and a lot of that short, that shoreline, natural shoreline was lost as well as the wetland um, there. This is more now on the southern part of the lake. This is 1938. Here's another wetland um, on the lake, 1938 and here's 2014. So quite dramatic, uh, a lot a loss of, well, the wetland is, is a, almost a total loss of wetland and now built up. And so um, quite a bit of, of loss. This is not a abnormal scene on our lakes in Southern Michigan. In fact, a study done in 2012 uh, by a team in the DNR showed that uh, it's estimated around 70% of the lakes in Southern Michigan, south of Gaylord, uh, Grayling South um, is intensely developed. And uh, that's interesting because so we, we have an identity in our lakes. So the Great Lakes surround us, but we also have 11,000 lakes that pocket uh, our, our inland areas. And with that, we have over a million anglers and we just love living on lakes. And that love has, has uh, dealt a blow to the quality of these systems. The, um, the EPA along with EGLE uh, periodically does a study called the National Lake Assessment uh, here in Michigan. They do it over the whole United States, but specifically here in Michigan, EGLE works with them. And what we're seeing here is, so on this axis, we have the different stressors to our lakes. So lake habitat complexity, just that's habitat on lakes. Um, and then on the bottom is the percentage of lakes that were studied that are seen as either mostly disturbed or mostly disturbed, most disturbed in red and moderately disturbed in yellow and least disturbed, not assessed. And what we can see here is the top 
threat, the top, top stressor to our Michigan Inland Lakes is the loss of lakeshore habitat. So we have the loss in habitat here where around 50% of the lakes studied were in the most disturbed category. And interesting, you know, so, so just skipping the second one, riparian vegetation, that's also indicating habitat, shallow water habitats, also habitat, lakeshore disturbance, those are all measures of habitat loss. But interesting, mercury is up here as well. And um, we can't go onto our water bodies and go fishing without knowing about the mercury that is that builds up in the fish. Um, and therefore, we have to look into that eat safe fish campaign to know how many fish and what size we should consume while um, looking at our health. Habitat loss also, uh, it's, it's not just the, uh, there's a few things is that this has an impact on, on the organisms that live there. So when we have uh, the loss of trees, shrubs, flowers, grasses, sedges on the shoreline and within the, in the water itself, we lose habitat for fish, birds, amphibians, and reptiles. And we see that impact. We can actually have loss of fish populations or, re or changes in the, uh, in the um, sorry, we can have loss of frog populations and changes in fish populations. And for water quality, we also see some changes. So like I said, phosphorus is a really important nutrient when we look at pollutants, uh, nutrient pollutants because of algae. And so what I, what I wanna show you here is on the vertical axis, we have two figures. We have total phosphorus and we have algae. And then we have lakes that were septic system lakes, lakes that have sewers, so the more urban lakes, and then undeveloped lakes. And what we see here is more phosphorus and more algae in the developed lakes than in the undeveloped lakes. So when we start to remove habitat and move onto these um, water bodies, we start to see a decline in water quality. And now it's not just about lakes. When we look at wetlands themselves, we have lost a tremendous amount of wetlands in Michigan, specifically in some of our counties where the highest wetland loss has been uh, estimated to be in the upper 80s to 90% of the wetlands have been lost in these counties that are in red. Um, when we zoom in just to, as an example, again, Southeast Michigan, because it's very dramatic, um, the, the vast majority of them have been lost. And this has some major implications to our water quality. And that's because they do a lot for us. Um, there's a lot of ecosystem services that wetlands provide. And what I mean by ecosystem services is like there's, there's value to, um, the, to, to wetlands. There's a value to their presence. And one of its flood protection, um, wetlands have the ability to absorb a tremendous amount of water before letting it out the other end at the discharge end. Um, so removing them, you remove flood protection. There's sediment control because when water comes into a wetland, it slows way down due to the vegetation and the topography. And so you actually get sediment deposition within the, in the wetland. And so on the discharge side, you have uh, hopefully less sediment. It's great habitat. This is also where groundwater is recharged. So again, thinking back to uh, the previous water school webinar, where we talked about the linkages between um, the different pools of water. One way that groundwater is recharged is through wetlands. And so it allows for a place for infiltration through the ground and into our water, into our groundwater. And there is some um, pollutants that get filtered out. Some of the plants can uptake some of the uh, pollutants. Also the chemistry changes and so nitrogen for example uh, may be um, transformed to nitrogen gas and it's lost into the atmosphere instead of staying within the water itself. And here's a one second. Here's an example of what can happen with flooding. Um, if you are in, a, in an urban area in a low-lying um, location within the landscape, you are likely in a uh, what once was a wetland, but now when it's impervious surface, um, water collects and you can have some massive flooding. So that, that was kind of the main parts of uh, the presentation issues we wanted to talk about. But as you know, there are a whole lot of other issues out there that we could talk about and spend a lot more time diving into them. Um, and, and I will cover just a couple more um, that have implications to a lot of the things I just talked about.
and one of that is a changing climate. So as we get more and more heavy rainfall events, we get more and more runoff um, issues and flooding issues. And when we have those issues, we have more pollutants. And we really have to worry about how do we deal with those huge flushes of water that's coming off of our landscape and going into our water bodies. How can we slow it down? Um, also, water, our, our lakes are warming. Some studies out of Wisconsin showed that uh, there's, we're, they're estimating that the, most of the natural reproducing walleye within the inland lakes in Wisconsin will be gone in the next 50 years um, or will be depleted. Um, and that's due to the warming waters. Um, this is because these cool water fish need colder, higher oxygenated waters to survive. Another issue that's uh, affecting many of our communities is invasive species. This is a great picture to show like the, Im uh, it's kind of a, uh, an interesting impact of, of invasive species on your community. So here's a nice neighborhood. And what do you have here is a possibly 15 foot tall wall of Phragmites or giant reed, an invasive grass that we see all over um, the state, but specifically in the Southeast uh, or Southern part of the state. But invasive species cause harm to your community, cause harm to the environment from outcompeting and replacing native plants to introducing pathogens. It has impacts on our environment, our, our, our economics because it can cost a lot of money to control. It can reduce property values. It can damage infrastructure and uh, compromise tourism. And of course, um, there's a lot of other ones out there and um, your communities might be dealing with some of them um, as we speak. So for example, beach closures are fairly common in different parts of the state due to E. coli. Um, and uh, there's more and more concern about contaminants that are coming off of asphalt sealants. And so asphalt sealants are making all of our pavement nice and black that are, and extending the life. Well, there's, a, there's some contaminants coming off of there that we're seeing in a lot of different locations. And that's a cause of concern as we start to see it build up in our water bodies. The next question is, what are those impacts? And of course, the broader issues of plastic pollution and microplastics, you know, so it's not just big pieces of pollution, it's also small chunks of, uh, that, that get broken down through time where now you're, the question is, as the plastics get smaller and smaller into microplastics and nanoplastics, what are those implications to us as individuals? And some of the, the ones that are fairly scary, like pharmaceuticals, um, and more broadly speaking, endocrine disrupting compounds. So these are compounds, these are pollutants that impact our end endocrine system, which is our hormone regulation um, system. Um, you can have some, uh, we're seeing these in different water bodies throughout the world, and there's cause for concern because they're impacting our fish populations, which that may be a canary in the coal mine to us or for us. A lot of so a lot of what I just mentioned can seem quite overwhelming um, and and a lot of negative news. However, um, I, I don't think there's a reason to be uh, have a defeatist attitude. We can do a lot, and for example, community planning can prevent and mitigate many water quality issues, and you know where we can maintain what we desire in our water bodies. If it's fishing, if it's wildlife viewing. Uh, or if it's for the wildlife in itself, if it's for swimming, drinking, community planning, coming together, um, not just as an individual community or a planning team, but as multiple communities, maybe through watershed councils and assemblies, um, finding a mechanism to come together. Um, there's lots of things we can do um, to improve our water situation. And um, a lot of those are, are, are won't be new ideas. Um, there's a lot of things that can be done that, that we know about already. And so some of those are those best practices out there. Rain gardens, for example, um, can be utilized. This is a curb cutout rain garden. So there is a, uh, for example, there's a drain in here, that, a typical sewer drain, but before the water reaches that sewer drain, it first has to go into a depression where there's um, usually native vegetation, but not always. 
and that has the ability to soak up the water slowly um, and then also deposit different pollutants before it goes into the sewer, which then likely may go right into a water body. Or in agricultural areas, there's many, many different uh, best practices out there that can be done to keep the nutrients on the soil or keep your soil in place. This is a grassy waterway, for example, where here's the, here's the crop, but this is a zone of, of of water movement and so if this grassy waterway wasn't there there might be a lot of soil loss and so this is where uh, a farmer or producer put this in where they can maybe even utilize this crop uh, of hay or alfalfa um, but then also preserving that soil and keeping our water cleaner and then on the policy and at the community level there's lots of different things that can be done um, from overlay zones and different ordinances like setbacks many different things can be done to help uh, protect our water through time. And what's great is that this is a nice webinar series. So the next, uh, the next webinar is going to touch on some of these with water finance and planning on November 5th. So I hope you guys can make that. Um, and there's lots of different resources out there um, for uh, communities and individuals um, in urban or agricultural environments that uh, things that you can do to uh, protect our water and improve its quality. So thank you very much. Um, I know this is a quick um, run through of, of water quality and there's lots of things to talk about. And I just like to give a shout out to my to the other authors of this presentation, Bindu Bakta and Lois Wilson. Um, the three of us uh, have been doing the water quality session for a few years now. Thank you very much. And are there any questions? All right, thank you, Eric. Um, we do, do appreciate all of the great uh, things you were able to cover. I know it is a short time period, but we're gonna um, be able to follow up with folks afterwards with some additional resources. Um, I did want to take about the next 15 minutes or so to uh, turn it over to my Sea Grant colleague, Geneva Langland. She's been monitoring the chat and the Q&A. And so Eric, she'll pose a question to you that's been brought up by our participants and um, see if you can answer it. And if not, we'll get answers out to everybody afterwards. So take it over, Geneva. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Eric, for that presentation. Uh, we have a good number of questions coming in, and I'll encourage people to keep submitting them through the Q&A box. We'll see what we can get to. Several folks are wondering about road salt and if there are any good programs or alternatives or solutions to help avoid contamination from road salt. There is. Um, and actually, uh, Lois Wolfson uh, that I mentioned as one of the authors uh, worked on some uh, a project here in Michigan uh, a few years ago uh, with that information. And what I can do is uh, my, my email is readily available. I think I saw it on that last slide. You can um, send it to me and we can, I can send you that information. But also some of the other states are, are really putting an effort towards this. Minnesota, Wisconsin, and also some states in the Northeast United States have also been putting in a lot of effort towards um, road salt. And so there's a lot of information out there. Um, if you, if you want to Google or contact me and I can give you that information. But one of the things that, you know, some of the things are very obvious. So there's lots of best practices that have been developed and new technologies and solutions are being um, looked at all the time. But one of them is uh, calibrate your equipment, your community's equipment. And so oftentimes there's way more salt that is being applied than, ne than is necessary. Um, and actually it's just waste. You know, the more salt you put on doesn't mean the better the road will be and because there's a threshold there. And so if you can calibrate your equipment, you will be putting less salt on the road and then you'll be saving money for your community and you're in a better situation for um, your water bodies as well in your community. Others, there's, you can go in, instead of using rock salt, where it's those big chunks, you can use different solutions that have been developed, but different solutions ha might have pros and cons too. I know beet juice was utilized in some um, circumstances, but beet juice, I think also had research, I, th I think shows that if that runs off into our waters, that can change the biological oxygen demand. Um, so that's a negative of that, but I, I would have to look into that a little bit more. Excellent, thank you. And I 
know that we're sending out some resources after the presentation is over. So maybe um, you can pop uh, some links to those resources into the roundup that Caitlin is going to get to participants. Perfect. Yep, I'll do that. Awesome. So this is a question maybe for you and maybe for Mary. Um, someone is wondering about good guides or websites for identifying aquatic plants on their property, um, especially helping to distinguish between ones that are native and invasive. Yeah, perfect. Um, aquatic plants are one of my specialties. I, uh, they're, they're a lot of fun. So there are different guides out there. Um, I'm going to share the, I'll, I'll share some of those that you can purchase um, on on that resource that Geneva just mentioned, but just a couple of them. There's a great introduction, introductory book um, from the University of Wisconsin called Through the Looking Glass. And um, that has great pictures, great description of the plants, of aquatic plants. So Through the Looking Glass, through the University of Wisconsin extension. Um, and they have a couple other books as well that's helpful. Um, in Michigan, we do have some um, guides that can help broadly, and you can find, I'll make sure that that's on that resource list. Fantastic. And going back one uh, step, Kathy David from the state of Michigan let us know in the chat that Wisconsin Department of Transportation has a road salt conference every year that usually happens about this time of year. So if people are interested in that, they can always look up more info on the Wisconsin DOT's uh, annual conference. Thanks for that. Yeah. Um, let's see, a question. So a lot of the topics today were about either the Great Lakes or inland lakes, but do, uh, are, are the data similar and are the conversations similar around contamination in rivers as well as lakes? Yes. The, it, so yeah, the, the, up in the beginning part of my presentation, I gave those um, common sources as well as common pollutants in our water bodies. And that was from lakes, reservoirs, and rivers. Um, and they, they really overlap. If I separated lakes and rivers out, um, you, there wouldn't be that much difference. And so, um, we combined them into one list. So a lot of those same issues. Now, some of the solutions may change and there are still some, some differences. For example, um, wastewater treatment is typically discharged into um, rivers, not into lakes. So there can be some more um, conversation around that um, because with wastewater, there's nutrient pollution, there's um, pollution due to temperature, there's, uh, and there can be other contaminants. PFAS, for example, is a contaminant that can enter into rivers through wastewater treatment plants. Um, also, rivers, when we look at erosion and what we've done to them, so we kind of talked about land modification and, and I mentioned channelization. And so just habitats being, uh, rivers being channelized and dammed, those have uh, a little bit different, but a lot of what we mentioned still does impact uh, rivers similarly. Excellent. Uh, speaking of land use changes and um, different kinds of channelization and such like that, uh, we have someone wondering um, at what level of regulation or ordinance does protection against wetland loss usually happen? Is that a state level um, if conversation? Is that more of a local government issue? And I'm not the best person to talk about the, the law side of things. And that'll be a great question to continue um, to our next presenters in our webinar series. But there's um, regulation at the federal state levels and um, local levels, can, local regulation can come into place once the, and again, I, I don't wanna say something to, incorrect, but where the state stops regulating at a certain wetland size, the local government can come in and regulate further. Um, and I wish I could give you a little bit more information, um, but you will be getting that in the other webinar series. Excellent. Uh, we got another comment on the road salt question. Someone saying that Wayne State has been quite involved in road salt research. So that's a, a research hub to watch for information about road salt solutions. Um, Great. Question about nutrient transport through tile drainage. Um, wondering if there's any database or maps for tile drain locations in Michigan and if there's any information on the percent of nutrient um, coming through tile fields into water bodies in Michigan. 
So first, the database. I can't, um, Lois, I believe, is on the call. She's done a lot of stuff in the River Raisin watershed. I'd be curious if she can answer that in the chat. But I don't believe there is a one-stop shop for tile drains. When I've worked with different, um, yep, thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, and I have worked, sometimes drain commissioners or conservation districts can have old maps or they have old files that have been put in for tile drains. And so you can contact your local conservation district. Um, and it might be housed within the NRCS or the district or the drain commissioner's office. Um, you can find some of that. Um, also, I've seen it where you've actually, they've, they've, they've done analysis on tile drains by just looking at um, um, imagery because you can typically see um, the different patterns of, t of tile drains, but that's not perfect. Um, now, as for the percentage of nutrients that are leaving the tile drains, there's a lot of depends because it depends on the soil type, the amount of fertilizer, the type of fertilizer used. Are there different best practices being put down? Um, and simply sometimes it's just um, nutrient management plans. Um, and there it, but there is a lot of research happening out um, here in Michigan, Ohio, um, and uh, a bit in, in Minnesota as well, Southern Minnesota. So if you are, I'll, I'll make sure that there's some information on tile drains um, in, in the resource. Great, thank you. Moving on to a topic that's been on a lot of our minds in Michigan, PFAS. What are some of the steps that a community could take if they're worried about PFAS in their water, um, if it may have, maybe hasn't been tested and found yet, but um, they would like to get some testing done? Is there any kind of visual way to see if uh, a stream or river might have PFAS in it? Yeah, so that's a big, that's a great question and it's, and it's, and it's a big one. Um, PFAS, uh, so, so the first thing always to do is confirm, do you have it? You know, you don't want to be doing a lot of things before confirming having it. So um, get, you know, uh, contacting Eagle to see if your community is on, your drinking water uh, within your community or other spots are on a list to be tested by the state. And then working with them if it's not or if it is to see when or when can something occur uh, or when is it planned to occur. Um, as for Oh, I guess I'll, I'll finish that thought. So then if you do have it, this is where you can work. Uh, you can look at that MPART Michigan PFAS Action Response Team. I hope that's what the acronym is, MPART. Um, if you put in M-P-A-R-T PFAS into Google, you should be able to find that. Um, they're gonna have a lot of different resources. And one of the things will be outreach. Outreach is really important. Open communication with your community about um, what's found in your water and how much and what does that mean to our knowledge so because this is an emerging contaminant we don't necessarily have all the answers and so being open with that is important thank you lois put in the the mpart um uh, website in the chat um just now and yeah, it looks like that just went to panelists so i'm gonna make okay. sure that gets to attendees too thank you Diva. and um so now visually um speaking so so in in surface water PFAS can, um, due to turbulence on the water, um, can create a thick shaving cream like foam um, on the surface of water. So that can be a visual indicator that you might have PFAS in your water body. What's hard to discern sometimes is that there's a natural foam that we probably all have seen if we've lived on, or if we've been on a river or lake on a windy day or a, a, a stream that's rushing. And that's where dissolved organic matter gets mixed up and beat up and creates a foam. But that foam typically has a little brownish tinge to it um, and not as sticky, whereas uh, PFAS foam can be, um, it looks like shaving cream, very white. Um, there is a document and you can probably find it, or you, I know you can find it on MPART's website where they show examples and some other characteristics where that can um, help identify if uh, indeed that is a PFAS foam, foam. Excellent, thank you. And we've got some links dropping into the chat pointing to the MPART website and other resources for PFAS and we'll make sure that those get captured for the uh, resource roundup at the end of the webinar as well. Um, moving on to another one of those pesky emerging contaminants, microplastics. 
Are there currently any paradigms for monitoring uh, microplastics in drinking water? And are there any standards for microplastics yet? Or is it too soon? I don't know of any standards. I'm trying to think in drinking water. Interesting. So most of my experience is in surface water for microplastics. And it's quite the difficult sampling um, that you need to do there because you need to dissolve all the other particles um, that can, can be in there other than the plastic so you can count them. So it's actually quite difficult. Um, I'm not aware of, of in drinking water. I'm not aware. But please feel free to contact me afterwards uh, in an email and I can, I can start, I can look around. Great. So we learned that harmful algal blooms are certainly a big issue for the Great Lakes, especially for Lake Erie. Are they also a cause for concern on inland lakes? Yes. Um, so, so the one on the, with Lake Erie, we mentioned that one because it, it really impacted our drinking water. So most of the time we're not getting our drinking water um, from inland lakes here in Michigan. And so that's not the concern there, but we can be exposed um, by, by swimming in the water body. We, it, we can, it can irritate our skin. Um, it could harm our pets or kill our pets. Certain um, algae can produce enough toxins that can kill your pet. It can make us sick by consuming it. Um, and there's, I believe there's some evidence where also as wind blows across a algal bloom uh, that's producing toxins, it can get into the, an, an aerosol into the air and it impact us um, in that way. So yes, there is a, there is a concern for our inland uh, waters. And um, the big thing here is looking at preventative measures, which keeps nutrients um, out of your water body. Great. We've got just a few more minutes for questions. We've got more in the box and we'll be able to get to, but we'll see how many we can uh, still hit. If I have a stream or river in my backyard or one where I like to go recreate, is there a place, a website, a database where I might be able to find information about water tests that have been done there or any kind of impairments that might be associated with it? I think the best route there is to uh, visit the Eagle website. So again, that's the Michigan Department of Environment, Great Lakes and Energy. And you may be able to find stuff there, but if not, I think you could, you, you would have a regional non-point source pollution staff um, for your region. And there's a map available on Eagle and you can contact them to see if there's any impairments on, the, on there and what tests have been done. Excellent. Um, and one last quick question. Have there, has there been any research or do you know anything about the effects of water softeners on chloride levels? Yeah, there's some research out of Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin, there's a professor there. And when she was looking at landscape level data on lakes. So this is for lakes, not necessarily groundwater or streams. Um, I think it wasn't as big of a contributor as everything else. I'm not entirely confident on that. So I would, I would want to get back to you on that. So if you have further questions on that, I'd be happy to find that research and, and send it to you. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for sending in those great questions. Like I said, we had more in the box than we could get to right now, but we'll be following up with those after the webinar. Um, and right now, I'll pass it back to Mary to take us into the panel discussion. All right. Thank, thank you very you. much, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Eric. That was really great. Um, lots of great questions from our participants. Glad to see everybody um, engaging in the conversation. And Geneva, thanks for moderating those questions. Um, so next up, we are going to uh, go and introduce our panelists. Uh, we have three wonderful panelists joining us today. Um, they have a diversity of backgrounds and they come from different parts of the state and different, um, different backgrounds. So it's really great to have these three individuals with us. Um, I'm just going to start with introductions. 
And so first up, I have Rich Bowman, who currently serves as the Director of Policy for the Michigan Chapter of the Nature Conservancy. He led the organization's Great Lakes Compact Implementation Technical Assistance Team and served on the 2007 and 2014 Farm Bill teams. Since 2016, Rich has been a member of the Conference of Great Lakes Governors and Premier's Great Lakes Impact Investment Platform. In 2006, Rich was appointed by Governor Granholm to the Michigan Groundwater Conservation Advisory Council. And in 2011, he was ap appointed by Governor Snyder to the Governor's Blue Ribbon Commission on State Parks and Outdoor Recreation. He has also served for the past eight years as an appointee to the Michigan Timber Advisory Council. In 2009, he was an invited participant in the National Geographic Society USDA US EPA work group to establish a national ecosystem services partnership. He has presented to groups across the United States on freshwater governance, environmental flow policy, and quantification of ecosystem services. And in 2013, he presented on international water governance at the World Water Week in Stockholm. He has testified before numerous congressional and state legislative committees and has been appointed to over 20 legislative and administrative work groups. Prior to joining the Nature Conservancy staff in 2006, Rich worked for six and a half years as the executive director of the Michigan Council of Trout Unlimited. Rich has also served as a research associate with the Water Resources Institute at Grand Valley State University as the West Michigan Regional Staff Representative for the Michigan Farm Bureau and as independent business consultant to numerous nonprofit organizations. Rich has a Bachelor of Science in Agricultural Economics from Michigan State University. He is a graduate fellow of the Michigan Political Leadership Program, a water fellow with Michigan State University, and co-led a 2019 Water Fellows Program. He has helped to author several state and Michigan, uh, or, sorry, several state and federal statutes, including the Michigan Groundwater Withdrawal Statute, the Michigan Non-Metallic Minerals Mining Statute, statute Proposition 20-1, amending the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund and State Park Endowment Fund in in the Michigan Constitution and sections of the Sustainable Aquaculture and Conservation titles of the 2007 and 2014 Farm Bills. So um, glad to have you with us, Rich. Uh, next up, we have Marie McCormick. Marie is the Executive Director of the Friends of the Rouge. Marie leads Friends of the Rouge with nine years experience in nonprofit leadership positions, focusing on strategic planning, implementation, establishing solid organizational policies, modernizing their programming, and securing the organization's fiscal stability. She informs her work in various regional and local organizations, including the Fort Rouge Gateway Partnership, Water Advisory Council for the City of Dearborn, the Michigan Environmental Council's Policy Committee, and the Michigan Water Table, just to name a few. Marie has been able to glean important perspective into local and regional water quality issues, climate change resiliency, and water infrastructure challenges. She is informed by her master's degree in sustainable communities from Northern Arizona University and executive certificate in transformational nonprofit leadership from the University of Notre Dame. So again, welcome Marie, glad to have your experience and expertise here. And then our third panelist is Sarah Franzak. Sarah is an environmental management educator with MSU Extension. Sarah received a Master of Science in Ecology from Bowling Green State University. She's been working for MSU Extension for two years as an environmental, environmental management educator based in Hillsdale County. And previously, Sarah was um, working as an engineering coordinator for a local municipality. She's been a biology instructor, a watershed coordinator, and a conservation technician. Sarah's interests are in water quality, nutrient management, and the interface of rural and urban spaces on water issues. So again, welcome all of our 
panelists. Um, before I get into asking you all your questions, I did want to give you just a couple minutes each to um, maybe talk a little bit more about your background, what I wasn't able to cover in your introduction, things you might think the participants on our webinar would be interested in. So um, first up, we have um, Mr. Bowman. Would you like to give us a little bit of your background? Sure. So um, my background was awfully long there. It made me feel old listening to it. I think the um, in listening to Eric's presentation and thinking about water quality, the one thing that I would encourage um, all of the participants in this program over last week, this session and the next one, is um, we tend to think about all these characteristics of water. He talked about all these different attributes and contaminants and all that stuff. And um, at the Nature Conservancy and throughout my work, we really like to think about um, how water works. And, you know, ultimately, um, the Nature Conservancy was created to try to um, preserve and, and restore all of the biodiversity of the planet. And one of the things that's truly interesting about our freshwater systems is that they are so diverse. We have cold water and cool water and warm water systems, and they all function in different ways. And a lot of the challenges that we heard described, and I'm going to set toxics and contaminants aside, but a lot of the other challenges we heard described were because we have so altered the way a system works by the speed at which it flows, the volume, the timing, or the nutrient loads that we put into it, that we've overwhelmed the natural capacity of the system to process and to manage these things and fundamentally altered the biology. And so we really approach our work with water and water quality in thinking about how a system ought to work and how we can make it work the way it was intended to. Great, thank you, Rich, appreciate that. Um, Ms. McCormick, would you like to go next? Sure, thanks, Mary, and uh, thanks, Rich. That was, a, I really liked how you character, characterized um, the way that you think about water. Um, so it's been a true pleasure to work with Friends of the Rouge over the last four years. Um, growing and developing our ability to meet our mission, and our mission is to restore, protect, and enhance the Rouge River watershed through stewardship, education, and collaboration. So I serve as the Executive Director for Friends of the Rouge. We are a nonprofit or 501c3 organization that was created in 1986 in response to a demonstrated need to clean and restore Southeast Michigan's Rouge River, which is a designated area of concern by the US EPA, US Environmental Protection Agency. So the Rouge has over 400 lakes and 570 miles of rivers, streams, and creeks. It's one of the most accessible rivers in the state with over 300 parks, 33 public golf courses, 27 natural nature preserves. We have over 20,000 acres of parkland um, and our organization leads efforts to educate both youth and adults about the causes and effects of river pollution and promote understanding of what steps that they can take to prevent the further degradation of the river and restore its health for future generations. Um, and so um, just this morning, I had the honor of standing beside many wonderful colleagues to cut the ribbon on a new park in Southwest Detroit. It's called the Fort Street Bridge Park, if some of you have heard of it and it's located along the Lower Rouge in Southwest Detroit. And I mention this because um, on October 9th, 1969, just downstream of this park, the Rouge River caught fire. And uh, you know, at one point in the mid 20th century, there are over 82 million gallons of industrial waste a day pouring into the Rouge and Detroit rivers untreated. So Eric had a few photos of the Rouge and the Cuyahoga fires in his presentation, I'm sure you remember. But 51 years later, through the collabor collaborative efforts of political and municipal business, private citizens and nonprofit partners alike, the Rouge has literally transformed from a health hazard to a regional asset worthy of supporting recreational activities. This park links to major greenway arteries like the Iron Bell Trail, Diamond River Link Greenways, um, 
the sort of, in a way, linking to the Joe Louis Greenway, the Gordie Howe International Bridge, and the Jefferson Avenue Corridor, with plans for a future to connect the, um, the Rouge Gateway Trail and the Lower Rouge River Water Trail. And this park will feature a universally accessible kayak launch and a fishing boardwalk in the second phase. So as legacy pollution is cleaned up and recreation can be considered, creating trails and amenities that celebrate our water and the history will help refocus the region on the value of our rivers as natural resources and highlight recreation while interpreting past uses. So I think it's just a, it's sort of an interesting moment in time where we can actually look at the accomplishment of this collaborative work. Um, and you and your community have the power to transform, um, you know, these rivers, lakes, streams into something that is an incredible resource and asset. So imagine our children recreating on a river that once caught fire. That's incredible. So we might have a lot of issues we face today, but it's really important to, to take the time to celebrate our wins. Thanks. Thank you, Marie. Very inspiring words. Um, Ms. Franzek, do you want to give us a couple minutes? Sure. Um, you might think of me as the odd one out here. Um, I'm sort of uh, different in that I work with farmers and I help them meet their environmental goals um, in this changing world and the changing climate. Um, so most of the people that I work with are private landowners, which is quite different um, than, than maybe some of the other perspectives. Um, most of my projects address soil health, waste management, energy generation, and conservation on farms, as well as climate resilience and um, water quality. So um, I work with farmers, we make goals, and we help farmers achieve those goals. Um, I've also worked with planning commissions or um, municipal planners to try to work with projects that might benefit both private landowners and municipalities. Um, I guess when I think about um, water quality and the steps that we can take, I see that there's a lot of partnerships that can be built between rural and urban spaces. Um, that can build the infrastructure that we need to accomplish some of the things that um, Marie has done and that Rich is talking about. Great. Again, lots of, uh, lots of great context for us to start the panelist discussion. I really do appreciate all three of you being here today. Um, so, uh, just for the sake of the participants, uh, I will be asking a series of questions and then give the panelists an opportunity to answer. Not all the questions will be answered by every panelist, um, just those that they feel um, confident in the background knowledge to, to answer those questions. So let's go ahead and get started with our first question. Um, I'd like to ask, what are the most pressing water quality issues in your area? So Marie, do you wanna go first with that one? Sure, I'd be delighted to answer that question. So um, as Eric mentioned and showed in some of his slides, the Rouge watershed is a highly urbanized watershed. 90% of our wetlands have been removed. Um, and you know he did talk about that extensively in his Q&A. So, um, and that has a direct effect on um, the water quality in the Rouge. Additionally, in the 1970s, over uh, 5.8 miles of natural river um, was channelized into a four-mile concrete channel. Um, some of you may know the concrete channel in um, the Dearborn and Belvendale, Allen Park, and Southwest Detroit area um, to enable the build out of Fairlane Mall. So the location of which was actually a very rare remaining wetland that already functioned as flood control. Um, so uh, unforeseen by planners and engineers at the time, the whole project had been a costly disaster, both ecologically and socially, and dramatically changed the live experience for both humans and non-humans in this area for the worst. Um, and now the Army Corps of is, is sort of looking to remove the concrete channel at a huge public expense. Um, but, you know, unsurprisingly in Southwest Detroit and parts of Metro Detroit, we see heavy, uh, heavy flooding especially in areas of highly concentrated pavement, 
low-lying highways, residential ba basements whose homes were built in floodplains, in wetlands, or on top of ghost streams. And a ghost stream is a, a stream that may have um, uh, historically been at the surface um, of the land and now is piped, piped or um, sort of put into the sewer system. So during major storm events, water acts as a carrying agent for pollution that exists on the ground like car grease and oil, rolled salt, pesticides, um, and even sediment. And yes, that's a, considered a form of pollution that enter our surface water and cause harm to the life there. So pavement doesn't soak up water. It acts like sort of like a high speed funnel sloughing off excessively higher volumes of water than normal interior local rivers that result in scouring, destabilization of riverbanks. So all this pavement has removed our ability to store water um, during rain events and it's eliminated our wetlands that acted as our ecological kidney. And just like our kidneys act as a very efficient filter for ridding the body of waste and other toxic substance, substances, so too do our wetlands. And unfortunately, less than 10% of them remain in our, wet, on our watershed. So we see um, a lot of flushes of toxic pollution in our river. Um, additionally, the rouge is very flashy for this reason. So it fluctuates rapidly in terms of cubic feet per second um, that are flowing through the, um, the riverbed. And so storm events plow away already unstable banks. They fell large riparian trees. Um, and so in the Rouge, we have both combined sewer systems and separated storm sewer systems. Um, and this plays into the fact that we have a highly paved watershed as well. Um, so the Rouge does have one of the largest CSOs in the country, the Hubble Southfield CSO. Um, and so that is actually a solution. One of the solutions It's a great infrastructure solution um, CSO basins are really critical in intercepting untreated wastewater that discharge into the Rouge. Um, and, and so sanitary waste is combined with other materials that are carried off the surface during rain events and discharged into the river. Um, so when we have combined sewer overflows, raw sewage is, direct, is discharged directly into the local surface water. And um, I have seen um, and been witness to all sorts of fun things that float in, in and around after such an event. So there are actually um, 152 NIPTES permits which authorize discharges from combined sewer overflows into the Great Lakes Basin. Um, and in Michigan alone, there's 33 NIPTES permits for CSO discharges, which is actually an authorized legal discharge of pollution into the river. However, in the Rouge alone, there's more than 50 uncontrolled CSOs in the Rouge. And you can actually see a map of those locations on the Friends of the Rouge website at uh, therouge.org. Um, and I, so I could, yeah. So, uh, and, and another thing I just wanna mention is that we have been seeing some peak, uh, high peaks of fecal coliform in the lower Rouge during dry weather sampling, which is a really, um, it's a major concern for surface water quality um, because that essentially tells us a story and the story is most likely that there's failing infrastructure like um, clogged pipes or um, broken pipes, which is also a major water quality issue that's not directly linked to um, some of the non-point source pollution that's coming in from those storm events. Great. I'll stop there. Yeah, lots, lots, lots of issues in, uh, yeah. in, in the Rouge for sure. So, so Rich, what's your take on this question in your area? Um, you know, it builds on what Marie's saying. I think the, the two um, pressing issues, um, and again, in Eric's presentation, he talked about a lot of the, um, what I would say the indicators of the water quality problems are. And for some of, to address those, we have to get at the underlying drivers of those water quality problems. And really those two drivers are that we have fundamentally altered the way um, water flows across and through the landscape because of our um, human built infrastructure. And we need to build that infrastructure. That's how we can live here. We're not in any way proposing this, the solution is to get rid of everybody and go back to nature. But what we have to do is understand how the impacts of that water, of those alterations drive our water quality problems 
so that we can modify those alterations to address those water quality problems. And that's really what Marie's talking about. A lot of what we've done is Michigan is a very wet place. Um, you know, I had a, a hydrologist once that told me, you know, the lower peninsula of Michigan and the Great Lakes that surround it are basically a big stone bowl that's full of um, to the edge with water and dirt and the extra flows over at Niagara Falls. And it's a pretty accurate description of where we live. And so through the course of settling and making this a, a state where 10 million people can live, we've, you know, we've got 32 roughly thousand miles of rivers and streams. We've probably got two and a half times that many linear miles of man-made ditches. And nobody really knows how many miles of subsurface drain tiles. And those things alter the way water flows through the landscape. Mostly what they do is they facilitate getting rid of it faster so we can dry things out. The only disadvantage to that is that that changes both the way nutrients get moved and the amount of time they have to be processed in the stream. I, one of the things that was the most interesting to me about the ongoing situation in Lake Erie, and I won't get the years quite right, so excuse me for that, but we had a really significant bloom, and I think probably 12 or 13, somewhere in there. The following year, we had almost no bloom at all. And the difference between those two years wasn't the amount of nutrients that the farmers put on their fields. It was that year where we had a very slight bloom was a functional drought for most of the summer. We had an extremely dry year. And so it's a combination of the inputs and how they get transported. And the fact is many of our lakes and estuaries, while they've always been the deposition zone for these nutrients, we've made it significantly worse because we've changed the flow regime. The other big issue we're facing is um, we had the opportunity to serve as part of the 21st Century Infrastructure Commission in the wake of the Flint water crisis. And we know that um, we probably have 800 million to a billion dollars a year of unmet infrastructure funding needs. And those have real impacts on the communities that all of you serve, but they also have real impacts on both the sources of the water that we need to get our drinking water from, not just for drinking, but for all the things we use water for, and the receiving waters that receive those things afterwards. And so ultimately part of our water quality problem and the solution to our water quality problem is figuring out how to build and maintain the infrastructure that will allow us to not have such a significant negative impact on the ecological processes that are supported by our aquatic ecosystems. Thank you, Rich. That's great insight. Um, Sarah, what are the pressing water quality issues in your area? So um, thinking about the Western Lake Erie Basin and the Saginaw Bay, um, I really think uh, that the algal blooms there have made a big impact on the kind of research that we do. And our research is telling us that in the Western Lake Erie Basin, um, it, it, that agriculture is a big source of the nutrients that end up um, in the lake and cause those blooms. So uh, I'm gonna say that one of the most pressing issues is nutrient management. So when we work with farmers, we talk to them about applying nutrients in appropriate ways at appropriate times um, and working with them to develop plans that make sense um, for their farm, but also for the environment. Um, and then to kind of go off of what Rich is saying, the farm drains that are on these farms um, the, not, not just the county drains, but also the privately owned drains and all the tiles that are associated with those areas um, have to be uh, maintained and the water that goes to those drains needs to be maintained. Um, and uh, there are so many ways to do that. 
and some things are more appropriate in other places. And we can talk about those a little later. But I think the other thing is the rural and urban disconnect between the choices that we make for management. Um, we don't really talk very well when it comes between private land and public land or municipalities and rural townships. Um, it's kind of a mess when we make choices. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so you all anticipated my second question very well. So I think I'm going to um, skip past the second question. I was asking what things could be done differently. We've already talked about infrastructure and um, some of the other things that can be done. So um, how about this question? How can local planners and officials prepare for increased volatile storms and higher temperatures resulting from climate change? Uh, Sarah, did you want to take this one? Sure. Um, so I think the first thing that came to mind for me was to support your local conservation districts and their efforts to provide education, demonstration projects, and large scale application of best management practices that support um, resilience for climate change. These are organizations that are in place and they're poised to help you out. Um, so supporting those, um, those organizations is something that's pretty easy to do, right? You don't have to necessarily support them with um, straight up dollars, but cost share or even just support letters is great. Um, supporting, um, they're working with private landowners and um, outside the municipality through the drain commissioner or the public works person that's in your area to install green infrastructure and right designed gray infrastructure. Um, those, those groups of people have more control over the water that comes into a municipality. And um, that can be pretty impactful during a high water event, which we see during climate change. Uh, or we are predicting more during climate change. Um, so I'm not really gonna talk about high temperatures a whole lot. So I don't know, Marie, if you're gonna talk about that. Yeah, Marie, are things a little different in the urban areas or are there other things that people can do? I mean, I think there's a lot of similarities. I feel like policy at the national level has moved painfully slow in most countries, but urban areas have the authority to make meaningful change in land use and zoning, transportation, green space, things like that. Um, I think that green infrastructure or like sort of a combination of green and gray can really help prepare for increased volatile storms. I think that um, they help mitigate overbearing effects of climate change, like they manage flood risk, they help reduce the urban heat island effect, they lower building energy demands, they improve coastal resiliency, which yes, the Great Lakes are a coast. And uh, they help reduce the energy needed to actually manage water. So if you're removing it from the whole system, you actually reduce the amount of um, cost that, that is um, borne by the system. I, I was looking some stuff up and I saw a study in Portland where it actually showed a 67% cost savings by investing in green infrastructure over gray. Um, that includes sort of a riparian, sort of a menu of options like riparian buffers, reforestation, conservation easements, um, upgrades to culverts and drain pipes, just to name a few. Um, there's other auxiliary benefits like carbon sequestration, um, increased property values. And I do want to mention, like, there was a report done by the Huron River Watershed Council, which um, I think I've given a link to um, MSU, that documented the direct economic benefit of um, the river and the improved river in their watershed. Um, which was akin to about $53 million in annual economic output um, and $628 million in added property value. Um, and additional, additionally, I do think, you know, um, local planners can really help move um, the needle with green infrastructure by removing barriers or creating incentives to green infrastructure alternatives. So in 2017, for example, the city of Southfield adopted a green infrastructure ordinance and pledged ongoing support for the Paris Climate Agreement. 
Um, and so you can, you can actually check that out. Um, so the, the, just like doing simple amendments to your code is, is a nice way to uh, promote these practices in your community. Um, so Brandy Selechek, she's a board member of ours, but she's also the stormwater manager for the city of Southfield, might be willing to field any questions about how the city went about doing this work. Um, and she's also a board member of the Alliance of Rouge Communities. So, um, great. Uh, yep. Th thanks, Marie. And actually, um, I helped with that project in Southfield when they did their yeah. code audit for the green infrastructure. So thanks for giving, giving us a plug. Oh. Um, so next up, uh, we have a question about best management practices for addressing stormwater. So Rich, does the Nature Conservancy have any recommendations? So we have um, several. We have a, a project in the Saginaw Bay watershed where we're um, working with um, growers on managing, I, in some ways I hate to use the word stormwater because it's all precipitation. It only becomes stormwater when it um, um, hits the ground and becomes a problem for you. Um, and we also have a, a project team in the city of Detroit that's working on um, helping some folks deploy some green infrastructure demonstration projects. Um, I think that the um, the one thing that I would say, and I don't know the list of attendees, so I don't know if we have any drain commissioners or um, staff of drain commissioners within our attendees, but um, you need to be friends with your county drain commissioner. Um, they have, it is their job to manage this and they have the um, capacity to do that. Um, you know, a lot of folks don't know that the Aside from the Michigan legislature, the drain commissioner is the only elected official in the state of Michigan that has the ability to levy a tax against people's property without letting them vote on it. It's because we recognize that um, in order for us to live here, we have to manage water. And it's been that way since the late 19th century and everybody has um, both horror stories and um, love stories about drain commissioners, but that's what their job is, is to help us manage this. Green infrastructure, we believe, plays an important role, but it also um, may not, it's not the entire solution. We actually, um, especially in urban areas, it makes a huge difference in urban areas in infiltration and retention depending on your um, soil types and your site characteristics and everything else. Ultimately, when you put that much impervious surface in an area, you're also going to have to have some gray infrastructure to manage water. But um, in those areas, again, it's thinking about how without causing a flood, you slow down the flow and retain the water so that you don't have big hydrologic peaks. Great. That's all really good information, Rich. Glad the Nature Conservancy is working up there in the Saginaw Bay area. Um, Marie, I know you've talked a little bit about stormwater already and Friends of the Rouge has a lot, lot of experience in that regard. Is there anything different that you wanted to add? Um, besides re reiterating uh, Rich's comments on sort of a um, kind of a nice balance of green and gray infrastructure, especially in urban areas, um, I think that um, one thing that is helpful to think about is making sure your community has a watershed management plan. These plans are really critical to finding funding to support some of this beneficial water quality improvement work. Um, you can find out if you have one through um, the Eagles website, which is Nonpoint Source Program 319 Approved Watershed Plans. Um, and funding for green infrastructure is available in various ways. Um, two, that you have to have a watershed management plan for um, to be eligible are the um, Clean Michigan Initiative and the Federal Clean Water Act Section 319 funds. Um, there's a lot of Private foundations and Herb Family Foundation has been a major supporter of GSI. Um, 
And there are links to both of those um, that I that should be available for you as well. Um, but I think the last thing that I guess I'll leave you with is um, Friends of the Rouge is doing um, more of a regional residential rain garden programming um, work to bring a comprehensive residential rain garden program to basically seven counties in Southeast Michigan, because we've come to understand that tackling these sort of water quality issues must be done at scale. Um, so a goal of tens of thousands of um, rain gardens across Southeast Michigan by 2035. Um, and so you can check out some of the work that we've done so far on our website. Um, but there's a lot of different types of creative ways that you can go about managing and addressing stormwater. Um, but I think um, watershed management plans definitely have one of those. <laughs> yeah, and I know you sent us some really good links that we'll include in our follow up email um, mm -hmm. for those watershed management plans as well as some funding options for people who might not have one of those plans in place already. So yep. thank you for doing that. Um, so Sarah, I imagine stormwater practices might be a little bit different in rural areas of our state. Do you uh, have anything you want to share? <laughs> yeah, Mary, they are quite a bit different. So um, when I think about um, best management practices for stormwater, I think about the field as like the basic unit of how we apply those. So um, in field, best management practices are things like soil health practices, which increase the organic matter and allow that soil to soak up more water. Um, installing filter strips along ditches and streams uh, to prevent um, nutrients from getting into the streams, things like waterways and cover crops, all those things are field practices. And um, maybe they're not that important to a planner that's in a city, but those are all things that we are working toward out in the rural landscape. Um, and we're always looking for good partners. So again, even if you're not interested in applying those things specifically, um, just supporting uh, grants is a really great way to help out. Um, then as we kind of go up from the field, we think about drains and waterways. Um, they should be stabilized and they should be allowed to have floodplains uh, in the rural landscape. That's how we're gonna slow that water down um, once it gets out of the field. Inline storages could be added um, to manage that water um, before, it, it, it can be managed to prevent fl for flood prevention, right? If the goal is flood prevention, then we can put inline storage to, to hold the water in case there is um, a flood threat. And then finally, I, I think that culverts and bridges need to be looked at to be properly sized and aligned um, for an increased water load that we're expecting with climate change. So um, when those um, when those culverts and bridges are misaligned, you're going to lose roads, which is obviously a problem. Um, but it also has impact on the in-stream uh, sediment load, nutrient load, and the health of the wildlife in the stream. So there's a lot of impacts when those aren't right. So I guess th that's my, my top five or whatever. <laughs> Yeah, well, I, I do appreciate it because no matter where we're at in the state of Michigan, stormwater is an issue. We might address it differently depending on where we're at, um, but definitely everybody should be looking at stormwater management as an, uh, a, an, a way to ensure our water quality. So um, next up, uh, my final question uh, is thinking about money and how it might be allocated differently to help with flooding and stormwater infrastructure issues. And I think, Rich, uh, you had some thoughts to share here. Yeah, it always comes down to the money. Um, I think that early on, Eric talked about the challenge. And, and you know, this is what Sarah's group is, is trying to, or excuse me, what um, what Friends of the Rouge is trying to address is that you have to have mechanisms to coordinate at the watershed scale or somebody doing something really good downstream can be completely overwhelmed by doing something bad upstream. It also is what Sarah is referring to when she's talking about rural urban cooperation because 
when you look at the location of many of our urban areas, they are near the bottom of watersheds and often those upper parts of those watersheds are rural agricultural areas. And creating mechanisms that put conservation practices in place upstream that save communities downstream money is a great idea. We haven't figured out the mechanisms to do that yet. And so, um, you know, one of the ones that um, we played with a little bit is a lot of communities on rivers struggle with periodic flooding. We certainly saw that um, exacerbated by the blowout of the dams on the Titabawassee, but those communities struggle with flooding even if those dams had stayed intact. And are there ways that we can build storage in watersheds above those communities where the water flows out into floodplains and comes back into the rivers more slowly with storm events like it was intended to do. And somehow that money that we save those communities needs to help us finance the cost of creating those upstream storage or diversions. And it's a tough issue. We haven't figured it out yet. Again, the drain commissioners come the closest, but they're really only starting to think about storage and retention in the last 10 or 15 years. Their job for 100 years is to get rid of the water faster. And so um, thinking about that, you know, we have a project right now called our ditch project we're doing with a number of drain commissioners where we're um, putting in buffer strips to reduce the amount of sediment flowing into drains, which means it saves money because it has to be maintained less often and using that monetary savings to give a credit on the drain assessment to the property owners putting in those buffer strips. It's projects like that that will help us eventually cost effectively address these issues. And definitely a lot for us to think about and we need to get creative, that's for sure. Um, so actually we, we have about seven or eight minutes uh, for left for some additional questions from our participants and I, I've seen some questions coming in through the uh, Q&A and I just want to remind everybody if we don't have time to get to your question today, we'll address them in the follow-up email. But um, Geneva, do you want to field some qu additional questions for the panelists? Certainly. And as Mary said, you can feel free to keep submitting things through the Q&A box. We'll try to get through whatever we can. Um, here's a question that somebody asked earlier. Um, they were wondering about graphs of habitat loss in and around Michigan's inland lakes. And I'll, I'll sort of extrapolate the back end of their question. Are we seeing habitat loss and sort of water quality issues equally around the state? Are there certain areas of the state that are especially vulnerable or that we need to be especially kind of focusing our time and resources on protecting against habitat loss and uh, water quality issues? Um, I don't have a good answer for you on that because the fact is while habitat loss can become a challenge in some places, biological systems normally have one limiting factor and um, it often is not physical habitat. So um, usually in Michigan, because this is, you know, the glaciers only melted 10, 15,000 years ago. This is kind of a cold, for the most part, nutrient poor place. That's why our streams have so much trouble processing these extra nutrient loads because it's not where they are in their evolution. Um, our, um, our real risks are likely to alterations in the temperature regimes of our streams through having changes in the groundwater regime or otherwise um, having the other big one is that we just get excess um, nutrient loads beyond what the streams can process. In the Saginaw Bay, we did an analysis of what the limiting factor was for the biological communities, and in about 70% of the streams, it was the spring falling phosphorus load. 
And I would just add a little bit with uh, in regards to lakes, uh, a resource. If you go to the Midwest Glacial Lakes Partnership, they have a conservation planning tool where you can actually look at um, uh, various aspects of lakes and one of them being habitat loss within the first, I believe, 100, 100 meters potentially of the lake shoreline. And um, you can look at your individual lakes in your area. You can look at your county and see what lakes are going on there. And um, there is different prioritization uh, plans out there. And so uh, if you're curious about that, I can help help guide there. But, but that's the thing, like if, if you're in a county that is uh, your lakes or rivers or water bodies are heavily developed and there are a select few that are not, you know, then you can potentially prioritize those that are not developed, you should be putting protection practices. Um, Minnesota has been doing this for their um, Cisco populations. These are fish that are, require high water quality with high amounts of oxygen and cold water. And they've been successfully working with private landowners to put in uh, conservation easements within the watersheds on, uh, and then therefore looking at climate resiliency through time and habitat resiliency through time. Great, thanks for weighing in with that. Um, do any of the other panelists want to jump in? I'm seeing Mike's remaining muted, excellent. Um, we have somebody wondering about Senate Bill 1124, um, indicating that it's about stormwater management utilities, wondering um, if Rich or if anyone else can comment on that bill at all. I can comment on that. So um, we have we had a Supreme Court ruling, it must be closing in on 20 years now, called Bolt versus the City of Lansing, which um, created some specific tests in order for something to be called a utility. And the reason that this is important is that any fee that you levy as local officials, if it isn't a utility fee, it's a tax. And you can't levy a tax unless you let your residents vote on it. And there was a subsequent court ruling in the city of Jackson versus the county of Jackson that um, created some more uncertainty related to how communities could legally form stormwater utilities. And the purpose of these bills, and this really grew out of a group organized five or six years ago by Jim Nash, the Water Resources Commissioner in Oakland County. Um, the purpose of these bills is simply to provide clarity to local units of government on what they have to do to form a stormwater utility, to have it meet the um, legal requirements established in the Bolt case and to not be at risk for being um, sued for in basically um, levying a tax without letting people vote on it. Great, thank you for that. So we'll end on one question. Oh, sorry, Maria, did you want to comment on it? Well, I just, I, I, I really appreciate Rick, uh, you or Rich, you pro providing that sort of background and insight. Um, I, I think um, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about um, Senate Bill 1124 and like where the, where it is in um, the legislative process. I know that um, MEC or Michigan Environmental Council has had some um, issues with it, mm -hmm. um, but I think it's such an important piece of possible legislation that would really open up a lot of funding to support some of these best management practices that we've been discussing this whole um, this whole webinar. Yeah. Uh, and I could respond to that a little bit, and and I. Um, agree it's not a perfect piece of legislation. I haven't seen a perfect one yet. I think part of the challenge with it was that it only got introduced recently and normally when bills get introduced this late in the session, unless they're pretty simple, they don't have much of a chance of passing. And I think it was introduced primarily as, a, as what those of us in the Capitol refer to as a placeholder bill to let folks know that this is a really important topic that we want to talk about 
next legislative session. It's my hope and the Nature Conservancy has been supported for the last half a dozen years now of having legislation that clarifies for local officials what they have to do to create stormwater utilities in the wake of all. It's my hope that another similar bill gets reintroduced early in the next session so that we have the time to have committee hearings and testimony and get things worked out so that it works for everybody and is something that can be passed and adopted. Excellent. And I think with that timing, I will um, end the Q&A session, pass it back to Mary for some final comments. I do want to thank everybody for um, joining us today and another round of thank yous to Rich, Marie, Sarah, Eric, and Geneva for all of the Q&A and um, great information. It's been a great webinar. I do want to, before we go today, recognize the financial funding that we've received from the Herb Family Foundation and the Pure Oakland Water. I also want to say a special thanks to the entire water school team who've worked over the last six years to develop this program. We're only hearing from a small portion of those folks on our webinars, um, but the lots of people behind the scenes who've contributed to that. And also a thank you to our advisors who are helping us on the Michigan Water School Statewide Advisory Council. These webinars wouldn't be possible without all of their contributions. So again, thank you everyone. And um, we have a long list of things that we've talked about today from road salt, wetland regulations, tile drain maps, PFAS, microplastics in drinking water, the um, economics report from the Huron River Watershed Council, the Southfield Green Infrastructure Code Audit, uh, watershed management plans and funding for those. So lots of great information that will be sent out um, in about a week from today. So again, thank you all for taking the time to join us today and have a good evening.